So what I'm going to talk about is um, the th sort of, I'm going to try, I try to sit there and say, if I could boil down all the things that were the most interesting to me or that I learned, you could kind of look at it like it was the past 30 years or you could look at it like it was, it's, it's the current state of thinking because it's, the le it's what happens when you distill it down, when you boil it all down. Like, how does it, how does it boil down? You know, to what are the things that are really important? And some of this stuff gets a little, uh, a little esoteric, a little bit philosophical. But it's, it's, that's the place where I'm at, where I actually look at this stuff at a very kind of, uh, you know, a high-level rule set about making games that I just didn't have a clue. So can you imagine... Um, when I started in the business, um, you know, uh, 30 years ago, it was just about getting the job done, it's just getting the code to work, just getting the, making the, you know, uh, getting the features in. And if it worked, it was amazing, and that was enough. And I wasn't thinking about psychology or, or player motivation or emotion or anything. So what I, what, I, what I think is interesting about what I design today is that I think about all these different things and then the code needs to be there and it needs to be well written but it's not about the code per se even though I will talk about a little bit about code so this is going to be a really mixed thing so if there's is there is this mostly a game designer crowd we have uh, some engineers maybe some some art folks okay so I don't know what the composition is so one of the things that I want to do here is this is a just for those of you who don't know anything about me? This is some of the games I've made. Uh, I did a bunch of sequels and stuff too, but I just called it down to these five. They were in, they're kind of the interesting five. Okay, so um, the early days of game development seem sort of, you know, like it was. You know, we had, I, I had uh, I were, I, it was a 512k PC. I, my first computer had 16k of RAM and a 16k ROM, but. When I was working on Hardball 2 back in 88, 89, you know, I had 512K, and you'd think, well, what, well that's not relevant, Chris, because today, um, you know, we've got 8 gigs, 16 gigs, all this memory and all this processing power, but it turns out that a lot of the philosophies of the way I approach things uh, nearly 30 years ago actually pay off. And one of the things that I, I, I think that I didn't know, that I wished I'd known, and I'll share that with you right now, and hopefully it'll, it'll go somewhere in your head, is, is that client-server architecture, that even if, if I had done this on Hardball 2 back in the late 80s, if I had built a game that had a client and a server architecture inside of the same executable, okay, that I could have created a much more efficient ar code architecture that would have had the ability to maybe switch between baseball games on the fly, or uh, all the load and save code would have been super clean and super easy to do. So for the engineers in the room, think about this question. If, you had, if, you, if you're writing a game right now and it's on a mobile phone or whatever, and it's just, it all downloads and it just talks to the server for a few pieces of information, even though the server code, you think about server being in the cloud or server being in a, in a, in a database, in a, in, a, in a farm of computers somewhere in you know, Idaho or wherever. Think about the client-server architecture right local on your device because it changes the way you think about your, uh, about your code. Now, I'm going to inject something here before I forget, and that is, and I'm flying here because I only have 25 minutes, um, uh, that you came here today and you're going to spend half an hour with me. I'm hoping that you're going to get this half an hour back Plus, okay, so that's the goal. So if I only save you 15 minutes going forward from this day, I failed. So, you, so that's the goal. So I want all of you to hold me pretty to a high standard of getting this half an hour back with a multiplier so that uh, this was worth your time because I don't believe in talks that just, where people just talk and, and you don't get anything out of it. Emotion. We never talked about emotion. Not once. Back in the 80s. Even the 90s, I didn't. I might have talked around it. It might have been intuitive but we never really said what is the emotional state of mind of the person playing. So just in your office, when you get back home, whatever, and you see a build of the game or the product you're working on, the title you're working on, ask the person working on it, do they really truly understand the emotional landscape of what the person's going through? Whether that's delight, frustration, angst, uh, uh, accomplishment, whatever the emotional output is of that person. And remember, you want to make those emotions positive, and if you do something negative, it can only be for a brief second because you're going to use that to, as a jumping point to get to a higher emotional state. So 
Emotion is something that I wished I understood. Bless you. I really, really wished I understood emotion. Now, I was full of emotion, and I still am. I'm just one of the most emotional, dramatic people, but I'm only just now in the last five years, ten years, trying to really wrap my head around what it is to, to, uh, to, to, to project and map the emotional state of mind of the people who play my games. And you think about that. That's, pretty, that's, pre that's something that's pretty complex. If you sat down with a 21-year-old and you said, you know, I want to walk you through this, it's not going to be a five-minute conversation. You're going to need examples, you're going to need to explain it, and they're going to say, yeah, yeah, I get all that, I get all that. But do they? And do you? Right? Do you really, truly understand the emotional state of mind of what the person who's playing your game is going through? Okay? So I created this thing called a GDD, and I was whacking away on it, my latest big project that I'm working on, and I was like, this isn't a GDD. I don't care about a GDD. I want a game experience document. I want to understand the player experience. So I renamed it the GED. And that, to me, centers me. Every time I go into the document, I'm like, what's the experience? Like, if I'm creating a... a uh, you know, the, the, uh, a movie, I'm always going to be tapping back into what the audience is feeling, right? It's almost natural and obvious that you're going to continue to tap into that emotional, uh, the emotional experience that you're, you've, you're putting them on. But when, it, when we do games, we sort of get caught up in all the technology and the art and the visuals and the high resolution, this is and that, and we kind of forget that we're here to entertain them and take them on a ride. So it's just something that I... Uh, I found that I wished I understood better. Um, surprise. I called this the bedrock of entertainment. For a second, ask yourself this question. You hear a joke at a party. The, what makes a great joke? Is that there's a twist at the end. There's a surprise. It has to be a surprise. If the joke, you knew it, if you predicted it, it disappoints you. Now, in real life, what I, <laughs> in, in the sense of an everyday thing, you don't like, I don't like surprises. I am, I am the don't freaking surprise me guy, right? I don't want something showing up in the mail, I don't want something showing up at my house, I don't want, you know. Surprise is generally not a very fun thing, but there's this really interesting thing that happens in entertainment, whether it's a book, a movie, uh, a video game, is that surprise is what drives the person's curiosity. Think about when you watch Game of Thrones. Those guys are the kings of the shock jock. They're shock jocking you to death, right? They're, what was that? I thought I heard something. Um, they're just like, they're just shocking you, shocking you. Heads are coming off. People are getting burned alive. I mean, and, and arguably taking some of those things too far, all for the sake of surprising you. But they know when they write another episode, they can look at it and go, if there's no surprises, it's not, it's not achieving it. It's not going to achieve their goals. So it has to have surprise. So, I mean, ask yourself that simple question. If you're building a game, are you surprising um, your player? If they're, if they're not surprised... Then I don't know. I don't know why they're playing it. I don't know why they're doing it. And you can sort of, It's like a litmus. You can kind of ask yourself that question. Punish. We punished players. We didn't know why we punished players, but we did. You guys remember the 80s and the 90s. I mean, it kind of came out of the arcades, right? Because if you didn't punish the player, they, you couldn't get another quarter out of them. So that whole quarter-sucking model was important to the business. This was a, these arcades were a business. And a lot of us guys, you know, who were like 10 years old when we were walking to arcades playing, you know, Space Invaders and, and Pac-Man and Asteroids and whatever. I mean, we didn't care because the experience was so amazing. And we were just so, our minds were so blown. But we somehow weirdly carried that in to the home entertainment. When you had a PC at home and there was no quarters to suck, you'd paid 50 bucks for the game. And here you are, Still, we, here we are, still punishing the player. Game over. Get off the game. Stop playing my game. Right? What, what's, what was, what, it was just that we were in a groove. Sometimes it's like a culture, right? When you say to yourself, why am I, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing it, every day? It's because of the culture that I'm immersed inside of. Why in America do we love violence so much? And why are we allergic to sex? even though we all, everyone sneaks away for sex anyways, but we have to hide it. Why is that? Why in Europe, why does it flip around the other way? Why is violence sort of, and, and, this, and, the, and, and human sexuality more celebrated? It's just the way it is. It's the culture of the way it is. Well, when you're inside of those cultures, you have to ask yourself, how do I break free of that? How do I change that? And how do I do what I want to do, not what culture dictates to me to do, okay? Because this is the thing about, about video games, we, you know, it's an innovative, advancing art form, and we have to 
advance it, and we have to ask hard questions about things that we're stuck on. And uh, uh, I've kind of made it a thing for me. And so punishment is something that I, I finally get to the point where it's like, you, you, you know, if a player's doing something wrong, they're not punished. But if they do something more right, they get a bonus. And if you ask yourself that question, when do you punish and when do you give them more, when do you, when do you punish and then change it into a, just a standard reward, and then when they do something extra special, they get an even better bonus. I mean, there was a study done where these kids, this is, I read this on, I read this on this, I get this feed from, uh, oh, this news feed, and there was a study that they did, and I read this stuff, I don't know. It was really, it was a good study, though. They put a bunch of kids in a room. They gave them all a marshmallow. You guys have heard this one, right? I'm sure there's a bunch of you. And they said, if you don't eat your marshmallow and you wait, you'll get a second marshmallow. And what they found was, of course, a bunch of the kids ate the marshmallow. They weren't interested in waiting. And the kids who waited got another marshmallow and they got a reward, right? So really, both of the kids win, right? One of them got a marshmallow, the other one got two marshmallows for getting rewarded. They weren't punished. It's not like they said at the end of it, you don't get any marshmallows at all, you get, a, you get the, you know, you get a swat and you guys get, you know, a bag of marshmallows. It was just sort of everybody's like, oh, okay, I couldn't wait. But what they found was these kids later on, they tracked them over, the study went on for decades, and these kids who could wait actually got, uh, were more successful. Uh, by and large, more successful because they, they understood the value of waiting. Well, when you have players that are willing to wait and willing to make sacrifices and willing to um, uh, go that extra mile for the bigger rewards, you better pay them off. But remember, you didn't punish the others in, con in, in that context. You simply just didn't reward them. I think it's important. Great people. I have to put this in. I've gotten to the point where I just cannot work with anything but good people, great people. I, you know, I put some words down here, honesty and trigger. You, you guys know what that looks like. You know, over the years, I worked with folks who were jerks or assholes or just, you know, short-tempered or whatever. And I realize now that if I had had a, a skill set for picking people that were just mo those, those, good, those, good, those good people, I could have had a lot more fun over the past 30 years. And it extends, it's your own team, it's your boss that you pick when you go for a job and you get interviewed at a job or, you know, uh, you're interviewing them. And when you work with your publishers or your investors, it's everybody. Keep looking until you find the great people. That's a mistake that I didn't, I just didn't understand it. I, I thought, oh, well, they have money or they have talent or they're willing to work 14 hours a day or that was their qualifier. And I didn't put on that list, number one, was they had to be a good person. And I, I'll be honest with you, I'll work with people who aren't the smartest, aren't the hardest working, and fail in a lot of those categories if they're good people. Because I'll get a smaller reward in terms of the business side of it, but who cares, I had more fun. I'm not just on this earth to make money. I just, I just, I actually think that's a cultural thing that we've got wrapped around our brain so hard. It's, it's, you, you don't have to make millions of dollars in everything we do. We just have to, we just have to enjoy ourselves every day and, 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 and hang out with good people. I really believe that. Uh, friction. Now, this is interesting to me, because when we first heard the word friction, we heard it in the free-to-play kind of, well, I did anyway, you guys might have heard it, but friction is everywhere. I mean, friction is absolutely everywhere. Maybe friction isn't the best word, but you know, I think about it in TV. Remember back in the 70s and 80s when a TV show would end? It would end about two or three minutes to the hour, maybe five minutes to the hour, and they would hit you with commercials. And at the top of the hour when you get your TV, your show was gonna start, they'd do the intro for the show, the, the graphical intro, the song, the, 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 the credits, and then they'd hit you with a ton more commercials, and then finally about five after, or maybe six or seven minutes after, you'd start getting into the TV show. Well, that's friction. So now they figured out the show ends, put the commercials earlier, stick them somewhere else, the show ends, the next show begins before you can get your ass off the sofa. Because they knew that this is where people were walking out of the room, and it was friction. So I just like to look at other industries, and I like to look at ways that they have identified uh, problems in the way that people, uh, and, and you know, we never thought about friction at all. Like if you go back, to some of you here, obviously Steve, you've been working in the business longer than me, you've been going, you go back to the, I think in the, into the 70s, um, or, 81, okay, he's, he's like, no, Chris, <laughs> stop at 81. Um, still longer than me by a lot. But anyway, um, the, the, you know, like, we, we never sat around the office talking about friction. This is really important, but don't let friction just mean the onboarding process. 
It's not just when someone clicks on your link or goes into your game or whatever. I mean, you could buy a game, uh, pay 50, 60 bucks for it. There's, there can be all kinds of friction in that game. Well, remember, that player, that customer, has all these other games on their computer that will, if they have less friction, they might go into those games instead. They might play those games. I mean, ultimately, our, kind of our goal is to have people play our game, right? I mean, if, if, well, uh, that's, a, that's a given. So clearly, if, if we said, well, we want them to play our game, and they click on a button, and then they go to a menu, and then they have to click on another button and go to another menu, and then select a, an option off that screen, and then I configure this and do this, and then finally the game's loading, right? We could probably put a button, because we know how, where they like to go in the game, we could probably put that button right on the main menu so they can load it up, and they can go there immediately. We could probably preload everything that we think they're going to play, just on a lark, just to say, hey, maybe they're going to go there. We can do a lot of things to reduce friction, and it's not just about onboarding and passwords and usernames and two-factor authentication systems. It's about every part of the experience. I wished I understood friction. Maybe that's what the talk should be called, all the things I wished because I didn't understand friction. And, it's, and I call it one of the most important discoveries, because it keeps people out of your game. I, there's, some, there's some systems, and I don't want to name any names, they were, oh, they were, on, they were gaming uh, sites and things like that, where I called them the gaming firewalls. It's like they didn't want their customers to get in, the way they created so many obstacles. Like, like, even games that are making money right now that are really successful, that have these really smart people, really smart people running these things, and they're doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue. You go to their site because you're going to check it out, and you'll get hit with a sign up. Nope, sorry, username taken. Really? You're going to bounce me out? I'm, I'm here to play. What are you doing to me right now? And you, the, 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 the customer, the player has to battle through all these screens in order to get to the game. Crazy, crazy. Don't understand it. But in a way, you know, that's the world we live in. Data-driven. You know, um, back in the old days, real, I love telling stories, and I wish I could tell this story in its, in its entirety, but Hardball 2, when I did that, we didn't have the MLB license and the MLBPA license, so everything had to be data-driven. And players had to have editors to be able to create their own teams. Well, when I went on to do Total Annihilation, I, I mean, the light had come on, right, in, in, uh, in the 80, late 80s, so of course, I data-drive everything. Okay. Now today, if you're an engineer and you're an architect, and you're in the room here. You're like, well, of course I data drive, Chris. Of course. You know, it's sort of an obvious thing to say. But what I find fascinating is, is that we can continue to find new ways to data drive our experience and not have the answers to the questions. Like here's just one example. You get faced with this problem of localizing your game to all the different countries of the world. Well, we have systems now where we can have those players in those countries localize for us. And then that information can go up to a database, and that can be downloaded to every other person who speaks that, that language. And you know, crowdsource it. It's a sense you, you have to have an architecture that allows this kind of data-driven design. Data-driven des uh, game engines allow you to create a thriving mod communities. Total Annihilation, which is coming up on 20 years, literally, I guess it's August, so next month it's the 20th anniversary of Total Annihilation on September 4th. Um, I cannot believe that people are still doing stuff with that game. And, and it's funny because the things I chose not to data drive, think about this for a second, they're the things that they're the most disappointed with me on because they're like, we can't change this and we can't change that because you hard coded it. And I was like, yeah, well I did, you know, and I feel bad because I literally, I, I, I felt like I was on the bleeding edge of what it is to create a completely data driven experience. I mean, there's so many more things I could have data drove, but you also can't turn your project into a, uh, just an engineer's wet dream. You have to have, um, you know, you have to have a reason what you do. But today, with the sophistication of the technology and the way we can do stuff, we can data drive so much. And it allows more people to get hands-on with the game, and it doesn't, you have to recompile. There's so many reasons data drift data-driven architecture. So you can ask that question if you're working on a team. Hey, is that something I can change offline in a text file or a, in a configuration file? Because if it's not, why? I want to know why. Why can't I change that? And uh, so it's data-driven. I had to throw that in because I just, I just love the technical side of that. Persistence, where players can grow their investment. Think about games. Like, I used to play Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, on the Sega Genesis. And it got to the point where the game was so good that I was willing to play through all those early levels again and again and again and again and again, only to die on the really interesting level. Mm, right? That's just some sort of weird thing that came out of, again, the arcades. But today, there's no excuse. 
that everything the player does should be, should be earning um, rewards and achievements and creating a sense of if I go back and play a little bit today, even if I have a shitty day with the game, I'm going to earn stuff that's going to allow me to do, you know, it's going to accrue a, a reward that I'm going to get down the road. Um, you know, and uh, I could have, there's so many wonderful examples, but to me, I didn't understand persistence. If I understood persistence 30 years ago and I built persistence into every game I made, those games would be 20, 30 percent more successful, guaranteed, because people would say, I just like to play and I just kind of keep, the game keeps opening up to me and giving me things. Okay? A lot of you understand this point, but maybe some of you don't. Threw it in there. Um, fortune favors boldness. One of the things that I don't understand and I've only got six minutes here, at Mo I've probably only got one minute, is there's 5,000 games released on Steam. We know that only a fraction of those games are going to be financially successful. Mind you, a lot of people had fun making them, but they kind of want to be paid for their work. But were they bold? Were those games bold? Did they take chances? Did they do something interesting? Did they say, wait till the world sees this? Wait till they get a load of me. That was a line from... Uh, Batman, um, you know, that's the, that's, that's the thing. What, you, you, if you don't have something like that in your game where people go, oh, I gotta show my friend, if there's nothing bold. I took that line off of the USS Enterprise, I think it fought in World War II, it's on the, it's on the bridge, or it was a, one of the big carriers. I'm not a big war nut, but I love the line. Fortune favors boldness. So I think it's really good on Monday morning, you come into the office and you say, are we being bold? Are we being bold? Are we doing stuff that kind of scares the shit out of other people? Are we freaking some people out, including ourselves? Because if we're not, if we're just walking a straight line here and taking it safe the whole way, make it, then, then you're probably not reaching the, the true potential. Um, check out Chris Taylor Pottery on Instagram. I know, that was supposed to get a laugh, but, you know. Um, I'm doing pottery. It's really great for the soul. That's another thing. Dreams versus goals. I threw this slide in. I heard the word dreams my whole life, and I'll hear people throw it out quick. Oh, I have a dream, I'm gonna go to Venice. Oh, I have a dream that one day I'm gonna drive a Ferrari. I'm gonna have a dream. Well, why, why have a dream? You're just already failing. Make it a goal. And then if you have a goal, you can say, well, what's the halfway point to the goal? What's the quarter, what's the steps? Because if I just follow the steps, I'll get it. And I've always felt personally like I've always managed to achieve all the things I wanted to achieve in life, and uh, it's because I never once said they were dreams. I never said, I have a dream one day of making video games. I have a dream of running my own business. I have a dream of, you know, it was always, this is what I'm doing. And when you say it, say it with conviction. So some of you may have some dreams that you need to switch them, flip them into goals. Health and family, I say, don't F this up. Um, it's really important. I wished I understood it, but I figured it out probably sooner than most. You got to take the time for the family and you got to take the time to keep yourself in shape. I do one minute of exercise per day, and you know I tell people that, they don't believe me. And I say, really? You come live with me and see, I do one minute of exercise per day, and I, people will hear that, and they'll say, well, I can do one minute of exercise per day. They literally, they really, and I go, well, do it then. Check back with those people. Guess what? They don't. Exercise somehow has become marginalized down to zero for so many people in the world. So many of, of the people, especially, who have office jobs, who say, I'm too busy. How the heck can you be so busy you don't have one minute? That's bullshit, right? You got a minute. Take, just take my personal challenge. Try to do one minute of exercise a day for the next year, and then come back and talk to me about it. And you know what you're going to tell me? I'm going to tell you right now. You're going to say, shit, dude, that's awesome. Awesome. One minute, I canceled my Gold's Gym membership that I never went to, and uh, I, I'm, 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 and my core is strong. I do push-ups. I do about 45 push-ups every day before I get in the shower. Okay, I'm out of time. I went to the Strong Museum of Play a week ago. I loved it. You guys probably haven't even heard of it. This is such a great story. There's this rich girl. Her parents were super rich. They were one of the early investors in the Kodak Eastman Company. The, daughter had, the parents had so much money, they really didn't raise their daughter right. They just gave her so much money uh, to spend on things. She kind of just turned into an ultimate consumer. But instead of just being a spoiled rich girl, she went and collected dolls. And she had so many dolls in her house. By the time she was old and essentially you know, on her last you know, 
uh, on the victory lap of life, I guess. She, she created this fund to, to fund this, um, the museum, the Strong Museum of Play. It's actually the Strong National Museum of Play. And it is the most amazing place for play and games. And I think to myself, why don't more people let, <laughs> let go and just do whatever, you know, take money and go out and collect things and do interesting eccentric things. We sort of, we sort of have a, I think we have, you know, like, uh, like Leno's garage or Leno and his car collection. I love that. And he's not the richest guy in the world, but he, he creates a car collection and it's awesome, right? And he'll pro it'll probably be around for a very, very, very long time. And I love the fact that the story of the Strong Museum is so interesting to me that if it wasn't for some sort of eccentric, weird, rich people that we wouldn't have this incredible place, truly incredible place, to, uh, to go and study and be inspired by games. And, uh, and frankly, you know, toys and, and, and play. All right, I think I did it with one minute to spare. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. Hey Chris, thanks for the talk. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, data-driven uh, game development, and I was curious, uh, where do you draw the line between when game design decisions are data-driven as opposed and in conflict with you know, feedback from your team and also feedback from focus tests? Well, data-driven shouldn't have any impact whatsoever on the decision, the decision to put a value into the data-driven, you know, the, the, the text file or the data file or whatever um, is, is really independent. You have the same process there. Um, it's fascinating that's your question because it, it seems so kind of technical and um, it seems kind of obvious, but when you really think about it, um, that architecture is, is so, it's, it's, it's evocative because it makes you ask, ask really interesting questions about the way you're building the, about the, way you're building the game. But yeah, the, the, the creative aspect of it should be completely 100% separate from, um, uh, from the, archi the code architecture. You're still putting anything in there that you want to put in there. You know, that's driven through a pro whatever your process is. Now, I, I left a whole slide out on vision and vision holders because it's too deep, too much. Um, another area I wished I'd understood a lot, a lot better 30 years ago, but um, that's, it kind of starts to tie into that. But same process, just the fact that it's data-driven. Yeah. Thanks, man. Okay. Super. Chris, thank you very much. Yeah.